Uh, welcome, John Mubaraka, 2016 Vice President, Presidential nominee for the Green Party of the United States. Uh, we are happy to hear you have it here. Um, I want to ask as a first question, how things with the Black Alliance for Peace have been going and what are some things you've got on your immediate agenda? Well, first, let me just thank uh, you and Ken for inviting me uh, to be part of this conversation. I'm, I'm honored to be here. And thank you for that first question. We, uh, the Black Alliance of Peace, we, uh, we're still working. I mean, you know, this is a very interesting and critical moment in US and global history. And we are glad to be right in the middle of, of this battle, a battle uh, that will determine in many ways, whether or not we're going to be able to successfully avoid a, a, a phrase, a phase of, 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 of neo-fascism in the US and a deepening fascistic experience for people globally. So we're taking up our responsibility seriously in terms of, of trying to put a break on US uh, imperialist aggression Right now, we are working toward uh, uh, trying to uh, um, alert people to what is happening in Haiti and the uh, uh, support that the Biden administration is providing to the uh, US puppet uh, in Haiti. Um, and we're just doing the work we have to do to try to win those forces over in the US who uh, see that you know, things are not right in this country and that the only way we're going to be able to as a collective humanity, uh, uh, you know, correct uh, the uh, direction we're going, which is a direction heading straight to uh, oblivion, uh, that we've got to organize ourselves and resist. And so we are doing that and we're just trying to pick up as many people as we can uh, in, this, in this quest. Excellent. Um, now, I know this might seem like it's hopping around a bit, but eventually I want to loop it back to the Black Alliance for Peace uh, voters pledge and campaign candidate work you guys do. In, yeah. um, so what is the kind of schematic that you and also your late comrade and colleague Bruce Dixon were espousing with this mass membership dues-based uh, green parties with locals and things. How do you kind of suss that out? And what do you think that looks like? Well, as you know, um, uh, Bruce is really the expert uh, in, that, in that issue, but from a common sense point of view, and that's where I'm coming from, it just seemed like it made sense for the green party to uh, move toward attempting to develop a, um, a party that had a, a somewhat independent economic base, a party that allowed for a national membership, uh, that uh, uh, was a party that would be a party that would be a fighting party uh, that would even go beyond uh, the uh, area of electoral politics but will be a party that will be transformed into a, a political party that would take up uh, many of the critical issues facing uh, the working class and poor people uh, and oppressed people in this country and really globally. So I think it was, it was rooted in an idea of what uh, the Green Party could be. Um, and it, it was you know, pushed back from elements that didn't share that vision who uh, advanced all kinds of arguments as to why uh, things needed to stay the same. Uh, but I think we are starting to see the wisdom of, of Bruce's um, um, advocacy um, uh, and that the party is still struggling, still trying to uh, create a sustainable economic base uh, and still even with, with the values of the party, still trying to figure out a direction a direction that seems to correspond to uh, the historical moment. And the fact that, you know, almost two thirds of the population in the US 
um, believe in a, 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 or see the need for a third party, uh, but yet the Green Party is still in that position to take advantage of that opportunity. So, you know, hopefully, you know, the party will get its stuff together, but I think people like Bruce were, were visionaries in the sense of what the party could be. Okay. Um, the uh, history that you have includes being a scholar of W.E.B. Du Bois and um, sharing in this notion of the black radical tradition as a very powerful uh, praxis. And um, one of the things Du Bois, of course, talks about is the wages of whiteness and the color line. And what are your thoughts on the fact that we still live in a deeply segregated country and we also have uh, progressive and radical spaces that are unable to totally overcome some of the uh, whiteness that infects those spaces? Well, I mean, it's not really surprising that we still have these kinds of issues in the US uh, when one takes into account uh, how the US was, was born. It was born as the first uh, republic um, established on the basis of white supremacy. Um, it was no, no uh, confusion about that. A, a republic that was based on uh, the conquest of indigenous land and the enslavement of African people, uh, where uh, the assumptions of white supremacy was taken as, as uh, common sense, uh, and that um, this infused the politics and the culture of the society uh, ever since. So uh, Du Bois and others recognize that. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that's very interesting about Du Bois' life is that, you know, it's almost like a bookend in terms of him being born in the 19th century and, and dying in Ghana in the 20th century. Um, and sort of em embodying all of the uh, range of political thought, um, you know, on the, the left and, and sort of center left, if you will. And so, you know, it's not surprising again that we have to deal with these issues even in uh, uh, the post Obama years uh, where even discussions around um, the, the composition of the working class, um, what should be the uh, correct political program for going forward uh, for, for the working class is still impacted by these um, uh, unresolved notions of what it means to be racialized uh, in the United States. Uh, and because of the confusion, um, we are unable to uh, construct a politics uh, that will allow uh, the working class uh, and, and all other uh, exploited and colonized uh, peoples and nations in this country to, uh, to create an effective and dynamic left. So until we start dealing with this issue of, of white supremacist ideology, um, that's, it's going to continue to be the Achilles heel of the progressive radical movement uh, in the United States of America. Gotcha. Um, what is your thinking on this kind of radicalization or maybe magnetization or something where people have become so very deeply entranced with Bernie Sanders and this kind of DSA social democratic politics and what opportunities do you think that presents the Greens? Well, that's an interesting question. I think on one, on one level, it really represents um, a significant um, possibility in terms of advancing the Green Party because it, it reflects uh, that there are increasing numbers of people who uh, have become somewhat disaffected from the uh, traditional kinds of, of political 
um, influences represented by the liberal sector of the population and, and the Democratic Party, uh, even though we know many of the DSA elements still work within the party, but there's, there is a, I think, a, a significant recognition But I, my, my, if I could like expand on that, like how do we get people to break that mindset? Because right now it's like still too many people think it's like, well, it's Democrats or Republicans. So we got to try to reform the Democrats. Um, how, you know, how do, how do we convince people? And given the electoral system, it's hard. Um, if we had a multi-party system, it might be easier. But even, even in multi-party systems, they tend to coalesce with some of the other problematic parties, you know. How do we get people to think more revolutionary, I guess, is my question. Well, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the question. <laughs> You're right. Um, that's the challenge. Yeah. You know, I, as you were saying in your, in your question, I mean, if, if, if the former democracy in the U.S. was broader, if it was even a parliamentary system uh, that would allow some degree of space for, for, um, for, for minor parties, if you will, uh, it it will it would open up space for a different kind of politics to a certain extent, but the fact that we have a, a monopoly of these two parties, uh, a political and a legal monopoly, and people tend to look at the electoral system in very sort of pragmatic terms, even when people recognize that uh, both parties are uh, are not up to the task. Um, even though we, we see constantly that the evidence suggests that people are disgusted with both parties, when it comes to participate, participating in the electoral process, um, you know, the choices they have before them are those two parties and they will take a pragmatic decision to, uh, to support one or the other. In our case, the elements we're trying to attract to a green party and more progressive politics are elements that would tend to vote for the Democrat Party, so it's it's a, a matter of 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 attempting to try to uh, convince people, and you can't convince them in the abstract, but to convince people that there is a strategy that we could pursue that can allow us to participate in the electoral process, uh, but outside of the two-party monopoly. And that might mean, and it means, it means advocating for a party like the Green Party and to suggest that there may be spaces on the local and state level that can be captured. But it also means framing that in a different kind of way, that we can't just talk about running candidates for office. We've got to talk about why it's important to build dual power. Why is important, why it's important to build independent political structures where participation, participation in the electoral process becomes just one aspect of the work of these new formations. So I think that is the appeal that has to be developed. And when we develop that appeal, we understand we're not going to get mass-based support for that in the beginning. But it's an appeal that can at least begin to galvanize those elements of the of, of the left, those activists and organizers who are trying to figure out how to, uh, to, to relate to, to the electoral process, who, who have the same question you just raised. So when we bring those elements into a formation like the Green Party, then we can begin to, um, uh, to duplicate, uh, to, to, to expand ourselves into a a broader and broader movement, bringing in more and more elements uh, who can share the vision and who are prepared to engage in, in the work of building this independent new structure from the bottom up. So the, the shorthand response is, you know, we've got to organize and build from the bottom up. You win people over through, through example, through practice. Right. That's, I think that what we're trying to do here with the Ocean State Green Party, definitely. Exactly. So, Very good advice, thank you. Um, Ajahn, touch briefly on the candidate pledge that the Black Alliance for Peace has put forward and you know, where can Greens of 
any background link up with that or align with that? And how do you envision the electoral realm working there? Well, you know, the context for that was, of course, the election. And what we did, we came up with a series of, of, of demands that we uh, suggested that any progressive um, who is running for office at every level of government, uh, they should be required to embrace. Um, and so the idea was to, to create an instrument that local activists could use to not just get progressive candidates to sign on to, but could use as a educational tool to engage the public uh, and to, to, in, in, to talk about why these particular demands were important. And not only should local candidates sign on to those, command, those, those demands, but that uh, those demands could reflect the foundation for a progressive, for progressive local organizing. So it was, it, was, it, was, it was envisioned to be that kind of instrument of course, we couldn't really utilize it the way we really wanted to because of COVID and the limitations. Uh, so it ended up being more sort of virtual than anything else. But again, for us, uh, organizing is, is central. So this was an uh, instrument that we thought could assist us in uh, organizing and political education. So the fallback position was we had people who uh, who are running for office, who signed it. We, um, we publicize that. Um, we use that in our sort of propaganda work. Uh, but again, you know, the, the, the campaign is over, the election is over. And what we did, those, those demands, we transferred those into, uh, and they already came out of, but we transferred them back to our ongoing uh, campaign work. Our campaign is uh, no compromise, no retreat. Defeat the war against African slash black people in the US and abroad. So those, those demands to uh, reduce the military budget by 50%, uh, to abolish the uh, Department of Defense 1033 program, the program responsible for militarizing police forces across the country, uh, uh, calling on the US to, uh, to support uh, the UN resolution to prohibit the use of nuclear weapons, uh, to close uh, the more than 800 US bases globally and bring those troops back to the US and transfer that money uh, into the, the coffers of the state and to address the human rights and human needs of people in this country, uh, to reduce, as I said, the military budget. Uh, to stop the uh, Israeli training of police forces, et cetera. These were you know, demands we thought uh, were important demands uh, that any progressive uh, politician, representative, uh, and local communities should em embrace, Re uh, shut down the US Africa Command. So these are, are, are essential uh, and elementary, we think, uh, demands that now are part of our ongoing uh, campaign. That's very insightful because I think you might know Rhode Island is this weird hub for the military industrial complex. And there's a lot of elements that speak not just on the local municipal level, like with the police training or the 1033 program, but there's also larger things. Like we have a lot of people employed by Raytheon, Textron, Electric Boat. Uh, we have the Naval War College. We've always been this Navy port. And so it creates a great opportunity for Marines in the ocean state to mobilize around. Definitely. I think the, I think the, the issue of, of the military, the military budget, uh, the, uh, the clear commitment on the part of both parties to advancing um, uh, U.S. power through the use of the military, it's their commitment to full spectrum dominance. Um, I think these are the kind. This is the kind of issue we've got to raise consistently. Uh, the people have to have to make a choice. You know, do you uh, just address your own material interests and and the jobs that you might be able to get uh, in these places where you have employment being offered by these uh, merchants of death? Or do you stand with the with, with 
global humanity? Uh, do you demand uh, and, and are willing to struggle for a world in which uh, we are committed to, uh, to peace and cooperation? Um, you know, the, the kind of, of selfishness that we've seen uh, from populations in the US and Western Europe uh, has to be addressed. We cannot, we can no longer allow for uh, the, the continued existence of, of, of a sort of a labor uh, aristocracy um, and a, a middle class or petty bourgeoisie uh, that uh, will align themselves uh, with the interests of, of the ruling elite against the vast majority of the people, both in this country and globally. So people have got to make uh, a choice and we've got to make them make that choice um, because if we don't address uh, what is really unfolding with these uh, irreconcilable contradictions of the capitalist system, if we don't help people to understand that they have an a, a interest in transcending capitalism, that they have no real interest in uh, continuing to support notions of, of white supremacy, then those darker forces, those Trumpian forces, those uh, more traditional uh, neo-fascist forces will continue to make inroads in the population. So uh, we try to uh, convince people that, you know, we have a lot of work to do and that we can only do so much in our communities. And that we suggest that progressives uh, and radical uh, uh, Europeans or white folks that they take up the task of organizing other white folks also, primarily as a matter of fact, um, and because that is where the real um, issue is. That is where the, 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 the reactionary elements are existing uh, and that someone has to speak to those elements. Because if, again, if progressives and radicals are not speaking to those populations, then you, you allow that, that, that field to be dominated by these right-wing forces and they are making significant progress. Right. So we just were joined by uh, Nancy Kaiser who's also in the Ocean State Green Party. Nancy, Ajamu is on a timetable because he's got another meeting coming up, but do you have any questions about organizing or anything you wanted to ask? Hey, Nancy. <clears throat> Nancy, get a turn your uh, mic on. Yeah, I, um, you know, I guess my question is this, like we are just getting started here to uh, develop a much more activist Green Party in Rhode Island. And, uh, you know, where do you start? What type of base uh, should we try to recruit or try to outreach to, to get started? What would be the base of people that would be interested in our cause that would help us with volunteerism, um, with events for discussions or films or things that on these topics that you're discussing here. I mean, it's kind yeah. of a big, big topic, these worldwide AFRICOM and, and these worldwide things, but um, where do we start with this? Do we start locally within our own region here, Southern New England? Uh, where where does a person get started with these this organizing? Well, that's that's a very important question. Well, of course, you have to start locally. Um, but what you want to do is uh, first consolidate your core. You have a a core of people that share your vision. Um, that core needs to be consolidated. Uh, you need to have a sense of of what kinds of issues uh, that the Green Party in fact deals with that uh, will resonate with specific uh, populations. Now, we know that, you know, issues around the environment are important, but we also know that at this critical moment, the bread and butter issues uh, of, of employment, housing, healthcare, uh, mm -hmm you know, uh, uh, access to 
uh, to you know water and, and sanitation, you know uh, education. These are the issues that are resonating the most uh, with the vast majority of the population. The vast majority of the population being working people. So you know the Green Party has um, some very advanced positions on a number of these these bread and butter issues. I would argue, for example, that uh, the uh, articulation, uh, the construction and articulation of the issues reflected in the Hawkins campaign in terms of those, those domestic issues, I believe on one level represents some of the most uh, advanced uh, set of transitional demands that are out there. Because not only, um, they, they go beyond just mere slogans, but you know, they developed some really concrete uh, proposals uh, that, uh, that can really serve as a, um, a, a basis for, for attracting people to, to the party. So this, this COVID situation and, um, and the way that uh, the economy now has been exposed, I think that the Green Party would, and, 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 and your formation would be, of course, um, uh, advantage if you uh, really dealt with those kinds of issues that are bread and butter, but connecting those to the broader issues. Like, for example, you know, the question around military spending. We can't get to, uh, you know, why it is that, that uh, uh, the national government, uh, state local governments uh, don't have the resources to really provide decent housing and education uh, and uh, sustainable jobs beyond the military industrial complex, you know, and, and unless we talk about, you know, uh, militarism and the enormous amounts of money being spent on militarism. Um, so, you know, I think you have to figure out what are, are the key constituents you want to reach out to, what kinds of issues they will be concerned with, uh, and begin to link up uh, with whatever issue, whatever struggles that they may be involved in. The one thing that the Green Party has to do is they, they, gotta, they gotta get connected to uh, local social struggles. You just can't go to the people and, and say, we got a candidate, you know, vote for us. You've got to, uh, and I've seen this so often across the country, we have green activists uh, and they involve in all kinds of activities, but people tend to forget that they are members of the Green Party and they forget to actually uh, identify themselves as also members of the Green Party. Uh, yeah. So that that becomes an issue, but it, it it also is suggestive of what I'm what I'm what I'm saying. Not only we don't just need individuals who are um, working uh, as individuals in various issues, but I think the Green Party has to begin to uh, sort of uh, uh, create an identity for itself beyond a mere uh, electoralism. You, you know, you've got to. We have the issues. You have to organize some local campaigns, mm -hmm. you know. So you know, I know I'm saying a lot. I may be, uh, but it's it's a systematic process, um, and in understanding in realistic terms, uh, the best uh, advantages you have mm -hmm. in terms of how you build build the formation. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I think vis visibility in the community, actually doing things for people in an organized way, uh, and then you get a chance to communicate with them and they see that you're doing something uh, beyond what the system, the system does certain things, but that personal outreach, I think, you know, uh, is much more effective uh, for drawing people in and they see that there's benefits to be had by being around these people that are willing to help us because, you know, and, and I, I totally agree with everything that you said. I mean, the military industrial complex has been talked about for the last 50, 60 years. I was a freshman in college when they first started talking about this. Mm -hmm. And uh, this country has been at war and in military activity my entire life. And uh, I just hope that 
I can leave something to my grandchildren and other people's grandchildren as well, because they're going to live with whatever we leave them in the way of a system. And some things have changed for sure, but systemically and underlying this whole military thing, uh, the military is the only department in our federal government that's never been audited. The only one. And you look at these pie graphs and it will say that the military takes 8% of our budget. Well, how does anybody know that? It's never been audited. No one knows, but they've spent $6 trillion. What could you do with $6 trillion? What could be done? We could do anything that is necessary to be done in this country. We could take indigenous people out of the third world lifestyle that they're forced to live. Uh, we could lift, like you're talking housing, Medicare for all, which they keep telling us we cannot afford. Of course we can't because the money's been spent doing other things. So this nation is now known internationally for weaponry, for uh, technological methods of killing people and war, that's what we're known for. We don't manufacture anything. What do we do? I'm surprised people do as well as they do and feed themselves because what exactly products do we make? And you can't answer that anymore. You cannot answer that. Yeah. And it's just, you know, that's something, I don't know where to start to address that, but you talk to people and if you're doing something for them and you're benefiting them, they listen to you. That's the way I look at that. I think I think Green Party activists need to start talking about democracy. We need to have a, a program for radical democracy. People, we need to to uh, uh, engage people um, so that people can understand that the conditions that, that they are facing are conditions that have been created because they don't have political power, that we don't have a functioning democracy. We don't have uh, the rule of the majority. So we have to talk about uh, democracy and economic justice issues um, and, and, you know, and develop some campaign work that allows the party to be out there talking about those issues. Uh, that's how you raise visibility. That's how you gain uh, credibility. That's how you also help to educate people. So you know, these issues of democracy and economic justice, uh, connecting that also to the our traditional concerns about, about the uh, uh, environment, but relating that to the functionality of, of capitalism. You know, these are the kind of things that I think people have to really consider uh, uh, taking up in a very uh, progressive, and I would even argue radical way, because there is a, a mood out there in the population in particular among young people. And Andrew, you raised that question from the, at the very top about DSA. Um, and one of the things that they have been quite successful in doing is attracting these, these, these uh, young people uh, who are increasingly becoming radicalized um, and, and coming into, into that formation. It's, it's, it's amazing to me that with the program that uh, the Green Party has, and you know, th there's that more of those elements coming closer to the party, uh, to the extent that it'll help to generate some internal movement inside the party, so that the party can really begin to map out a clear radical identity. Uh, and that's the only way that the party is going to survive, because uh, if you continue to uh, have sort of muddled politics uh, that uh, aren't going to be attractive to these kinds of elements, then the Green Party is really not going to be in a position to take advantage of the, uh, of the moment. And the moment is a moment in which uh, people are looking around for alternatives. Uh, but you got to have some clear, radical politics. Right now, I think the Green Party has an identity crisis. Uh, and it has to, the party has to figure, figure out what it is. Uh, they have to figure out whether or not it really wants to be a truly radical party. Uh, and that is going to require some uh, uh, serious internal uh, discussion and struggle. Right. 
So are there any points you want to bring up in closing before we let you go? Because we know you got this other important meeting you're working on with Haiti. Well, um, you know, it, it's Haiti is one of those issues that, you know, that can be connected to other issues that people should be concerned with, like uh, Venezuela, um, like, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the moves being made by the U.S. Uh, government to try to maintain control of the entire uh, America's region. Uh, so questions of U.S. intervention uh, and questions of the U.S. commitment to democracy are uh, questions that have to be raised, should be raised. Uh, it, to, to us, is such an obvious contradiction. We wonder why people are not raising it. That here you're going to have a situation where uh, the Democrats can uh, moan and groan and, and condemn um, Donald Trump uh, for his threat not to leave office at the end of his term. Uh, but then uh, Biden and those same elements would then turn around and give unqualified support to Jovenel uh, Moise, the so-called president of Haiti, to stay past his term. Even though it's quite obvious that the majority of the people in Haiti oppose him uh, staying in power. So these kinds of contradictions, I think, allow us to, to raise these questions and to sharpen people's awareness of the, the contradictions and interests. And to raise the question, you know, who are you identifying with? Are you identifying with the vast majority of, 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 of humanity or with, you know, the elite now represented by, by Joe Biden? So yeah, Haiti's important to, to raise when these support in terms of people talking about uh, the US Africa Command or AFRICOM. Uh, we want people to help us to push out the existence of this uh, Department of Defense 1033 program. Uh, we want to abolish that program. Uh, we want people to talk about Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Why is it that you, we have a peace process, a so-called peace process in Afghanistan that was almost um, uh, finalized and now uh, Joe Biden comes into office and they are finding, trying to find ways to, in, in essence, gut the program. And no one's saying anything. The only ones, only, seem like the only people talking about Afghanistan is the Black Alliance for Peace. And we the new kids on the block. It makes no sense. We need, we need Green Party activists to be raising this issue of peace and in Afghanistan. So there's a lot of, I think, important elements out here that, that we can embrace. I mean, you know, the lack of universal health care and the uh, 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 private health care industry. You know, we've got to just constantly hit folks with these contradictions um, and tell people the only way that we, we deal with these contradictions is when we build independent popular power. And you build independent popular power by supporting independent organizations. And that we need you in this organization. Gotcha. Fabulous. John Baraka, thank you so much for your time this evening.